It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Pillay Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Aloha and good morning. Thanks for tuning in here on this Wednesday morning. We're a little delayed, so we thank you for your patience. I'm Ryan Kalesuji, joined by Yanji Denise. And Yanji, this morning, we head on over to the Hawaii State Capitol. Yeah, we have some heavy hitters joining us this morning. We are very lucky to welcome Senate President Ron Kochi and House Speaker Scott Psyche. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Thanks for inviting us. Good morning. Good morning. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, let's start with you. What are your expectations for this upcoming session? We ha we saw a very busy legislative session, uh, what was hailed as one of the more productive sessions in recent years uh, last time. And so what are you expecting for this session? Yeah, so actually, um, you know, with, um, with um, you know, the Senate's cooperation and partnership, I think I'm really looking forward to the next uh, session that starts in January. Um, you know, here in the House, um, I'm especially excited because we will have at least 16 new House members um, joining us. And um, these members, um, are, they're just a diverse group of people. Um, they're from all over the state. And they all have different perspectives and backgrounds and philosophies. And I think they're going to totally add to, to the House this year and to our, our legislative uh, session. And for Senate President, how about for you heading into this legislative session, uh, a different administration, you'll also be working with your thoughts as you prepare for the start of this next legislative session. Well, we didn't have as much uh, change as the House did, but we in the retirements of Senators Baker, Taniguchi, and <clears throat> Nishihara lost 90 years of legislative experience. And so uh, we have people in new positions uh, who, uh, you know, are still uh, longtime members of the Senate and with the new cabinet and the new chairs in the House. I think, uh, you know, there's going to be uh, getting to know each other, uh, you know, period where we have to, uh, you know, find out what the priorities are of the new chairs in the House. They'll listen to ours and, uh, you know, we'll certainly have to have those conversations with uh, the new administrative team. So I think some of the early uh, ways and means and finance hearings will give a good glimpse into, uh, you know, some of the thoughts and ideas that the new administration will have. One of the big things this new administration will be tackling is the stadium project and how to move forward on that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let's start with you on that. What are your thoughts on how that's, how the project should move forward? We saw some last minute changes from the EGA administration in terms of uh, the PPP <clears throat> and just having it strictly be uh, just building the facility itself. What are your thoughts on how that project should move forward? Yeah, so I voted in favor of the $350 million appropriation to, re to develop a new stadium at the Halava site. <clears throat> and this vote was taken last year. And, um, you know, I mean, we all, I think we all agree that <clears throat> this site is, is a valuable, it's a valuable venue and it provides so much opportunity, um, you know, not just with respect to a stadium, but for other forms of development that can help, you know, help um, a, a, our, a lot of residents, not just in the area, but throughout Oahu and the state. So it's a, it's a prime opportunity for us to kind of think big and, and do something great there. Um, my only concern is the cost of the stadium, and that's something that I'll be watching this session. We, as I mentioned, we appropriated $350 million for this project. Already, the, there is a cost overrun of $75 million. So it was now at $425 million. Um, and that's an issue that, that the legislature needs to take a very hard look at. I do not. As I've stated publicly, I do not want the stadium project to turn into another rail project where costs overruns a uh, spiral out of control. And, and Senator President, your thoughts on Aloha Stadium and, and where it stands? Like the speaker, I supported the appropriation. Uh, the other thing is that there's so many examples of those entertainment districts 
uh, already <clears throat> on the mainland. So I hope that uh, by having an experienced partner, you know, we'll uh, make sure that it doesn't turn into another rail project with great cost overruns. One area that I certainly am optimistic is the need for some kind of hotel accommodations. Uh, when they opened that Hilton Garden Inn out in uh, Kapule, they've been experienced 90% occupancy rates because there's so much activity with youth soccer and baseball out at uh, Waipio and the Corp Fields. There's so many people who transact and do business at Pearl Harbor, you know, there'll be a great demand and we need to make sure that we have, uh, you know, the ancillary businesses that will succeed 365 days a year. And it's not only dependent on the activity that occurs in the stadium, but I'm confident with uh, the youth sports that happen out at the court fields and the business activity at Pearl Harbor that we could get that mix. And then clearly uh, we need to make sure we deliver on the promise of affordable housing units that are gonna be built there. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna ask you, and we're gonna tick through a bunch of different issues just to get sort of your pulse on them. I wanna ask you both about guns uh, and Senate President, let's start with you on this one. You know, we recently had a conversation with Honolulu Police Chief Joe Logan about some of the issues that they are anticipating with conceal and carry permits soon to be issued. Uh, and, and one of the things that they were worried about was this, uh, you know, that county to county, the rules are going to be different because they're going, you know, the, the Honolulu City Council is considering legislation that would create safety zones where guns would be not be allowed, places like schools uh, and, and different venues like that. And the idea that the counties all have different re regulations. Um, one of the things that he said that would be positive would to have, you know, would be to have statewide restrictions so that everyone kind of knows what the law is uh, across the state. Is that something that you think that the legislature will take up? Is that something that you would support? Well, first of all, we have some of the most restrictive gun laws in the nation. Uh, you know, Senator Rhodes has been very active in in this field. And so I certainly think that we're going to be uh, taking up uh, gun bills and looking at how we can continue, uh, you know, to keep our residents safe. And, uh, you know, certainly we're not here to uh, restrict Second Amendment rights, but we are here to make sure that people uh, can go about their daily lives in a safe way. And you know, at this point, we were out of the session, and so the counties have been reacting to deal with uh, the rulings from the court. Uh, now that we're going back into session, I expect that we'll have several uh, bills related to how we're dealing with firearms. Yeah, and Mr. Speaker, is that something that you would support to have, uh, you know, sort of a statewide system as opposed to county by county? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, you know, I also want to reiterate what the Senate president mentioned, that Hawaii does have some of the strongest gun laws in the nation. In fact, Hawaii is rated like an at A, A minus or A by the Gab, Gabby Giffords, Giffords Foundation, which monitors all of the state state uh, laws. Um, but there's always room for improvement. And I I believe that there are, it does it just makes sense for us to have uh, statewide standards in place. We don't we do not want to. Um, you know, impede the rights of, of hunters. But um, I, I feel that residents want to feel safe and secure when they're out in the public. And, um, um, you know, one example that we can look at is the Department of Education, which has promulgated um, weapons policies at all of the campuses throughout the state. So it's, there is precedent for statewide uh, standards. Another thing that uh, maybe the legislature will have to take a look at is something that Governor Green has campaigned on, and that is uh, cutting back on taxes for food and medicine. Uh, going into next year's legislative session, recognizing what the budget looks like. Uh, Speaker, what do you think about this proposal? How realistic do you think it would be to cut this tax? Uh, and where would that funding come from if something like that were actually to come to fruition? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is a this is a um, tough issue. I mean, every year there's a bill that's introduced to <clears throat> exempt food purchases from the general excise tax. And um, but, you know, when you take a look hard look at the GET, uh, the GET tax um, um, generates the most state tax revenue for for us. And um, 
the estimate is that 30% of the GET is pay, paid by uh, visitors, not they're not paid by Hawaii residents, 30%. So it's that's a sizable percentage. And um, the House has always taken the position that if we um, provide tax cuts like this, that we should target them, target those cuts for those who are most the most in need. I don't believe that we should um, enact a broad based tax cut that that disproportionately benefits visitors and high end high end taxpayers. And Senator President, for you recognizing also uh, what the budget looks like, and also economists say that we may not feel the impact of what many are saying is a looming recession ahead of us. Uh, how important is it to monitor these types of taxes and any potential tax breaks that may be coming down from the fifth floor? Well, the biggest challenge we have is for the layperson uh, that would see the headlines and that we have a $2.6 billion surplus, uh, that there would be a, a lot of money to go around. But the primary <clears throat> reason for the surplus is because of the influx of the federal money that won't be there. And so we need to be sure that if we implement programs that they will be economically sustainable going forward into the future. And uh, so I would share the same concerns on the long-term effect. I think that's why, uh, you know, we looked at the earned income tax credit. Last session, we gave a higher rebate to lower wage earning families. And, and the uh, message from both the House and the Senate is we're trying to get the money into the hands of those most directly impacted. And uh, we will be looking for ways to make sure that we can do it. And if it's not, uh, you know, through uh, exempting the tax on food and drugs, we will be looking at other mechanisms that we've used in the past and uh, making sure those who are in the most need are going to get that help. Senator President, I want to stay with you. There was something, uh, one of the things that the Green campaign, or that Governor Green rather campaigned on was this idea of an entrance fee, a green fee, if you will, to enter the state of Hawaii, levied on people, uh, you know, perhaps at the airport, although uh, when we asked uh, then Governor Ige about it, he said he didn't see a mechanism to make that happen. What are your thoughts about having uh, a $50 or $100 fee levied on folks who are arriving in Hawaii as a mechanism to generate more money, perhaps toward uh, environmental concerns or, or basically an impact fee, if you will? Well, at this point, um, there are some potential legal issues about being able to do that. And when you look at areas that are charging the fees, they are nations. So it's a federal policy and not a state policy. The airports are regulated under the federal government. And so uh, if that's problematic, then the hotels already have uh, TAT charges that they have. They have resort fees. They don't want to tack that onto their bills. So I, I think there are some real challenges in where would you levy the fee, who would collect it, and how do you disperse it? But right now on Kauai, after the flooding in April of 2017, uh, they wound up saying, we want to put some limits on KA uh, Beach Park. And so now there's a reservation system to get in and a parking fee, and it generates about a million dollars a year. Uh, during COVID, Wainapanapa in the Hana area started to get overrun with uh, visitors as well and residents. And so they've instituted a reservation system there. They're generating over $3 million a year. And last year or last May, I believe, they started the fee and reservation system at Diamond Head uh, Park. And I believe in the month of October, they generated about 900000 in fees, I think we have a mechanism in place already by using the reservation system at the state parks where a lot of those impacts are to collect fees. I, I think we could look at uh, Iao Nido and a uh, park or two on the big island. And I think we could generate between 20 to $40 million in revenue from the impacts of visitors who are going and using the parks. So far, we haven't heard significant complaints at Diamond Head, Wainapanapa, or 
KA beats on the fees that are being charged because these are fees that are charged at parks all across the country so visitors don't feel like they are being singled out here in Hawaii. And uh, eventually, if we get people using this reservation system, I would like to see the ability to have links that would bring these visitors making reservations to uh, local products and uh, see our local vendors being able to sell online through the reservation system. And how do we make sure that some of the visitor money is spread out to the community and to some of the smaller businesses? I think, uh, you know, on the reservation system and linked to buying Hawaii products would uh, really extend the reach and uh, people who would be able to have their products available to the visitors who are coming here. And I think a lot of these businesses have already re-imaged themselves to deal with COVID to have websites, online presence, and shipping of uh, their goods and products. Mr. Speaker, do you agree that the, the fees should be levied in site-specific areas as opposed to a general fee across the state? Yeah, you know, I know that the Governor Green is very excited about his green fee, but, um, you know, I do, I, you know, I prefer the Kochi, the Kochi fee, which is the destination, <laughs> the destination fee. And it's something that I think we, you know, we did authorize that um, a couple of years ago, and we should give the departments a chance to fully implement that. The example that I always uh, give is Hanama Bay, where the city and county of Honolulu instituted a fee about 20 years ago for Hanama Bay um, visitors. And um, the fee applies only to non-residents. Um, that that was actually that was an issue that was challenged in court, but the federal court upheld the non-resident fee there. So I think there's a significant latitude for for government to impose fees on non-residents, and it's something that we really should, as the Senate President mentioned, that we really should focus on first. One and, issue, uh, Yanji Ryan, if I could, with with what the speaker said, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, credit the new majority leader in the House, Representative Nadine Nakamura. Uh, KA and the North Shore is part of her house district on Kauai, and she really put in a lot of work with that community, with uh, Mayor Kawakami, Mayor Kavalu at the time, uh, you know, and with the community and with parks at DLNR to uh, initiate the the first fee at KA. Sure. Uh uh, speaker, we want to go to another issue that always seems to come up, and that is uh, the legalization of marijuana. Uh, this is an issue that is gaining momentum throughout the country, and we know that there are studies being done right now. Refumani was on this program a few months ago talking about some of the studies that they're doing to see how that would work and the mechanisms that would need to be in place in order for the state to take something like this on. Uh, do you think that this could be the session where the legalization of marijuana passes here in Hawaii? Well, I'm waiting for the um, the final report from the task force. I haven't received it yet, and um, you know we'll take a hard look at it. And I think it, it's a it's a the the task force is pretty well represented. Um, the there's always you know every year there's a bill introduced to legalize mar recreational marijuana, and um, we'll you know we'll we'll uh, see see how the report looks. But you know the one thing to keep in mind is that there's still some federal restrictions in place on marijuana. So, for example, um, you know, it's basically still a cash-based um, industry. Um, you can't transport, you can't use highways or federal or, or federally regulated um, uh, carriers to transport marijuana. So there's a lot of restrictions that are still built in that we need to consider um, if we take up this legislation. Senator President, your thoughts, would you support the legalization of marijuana if this is a bill that actually does come through uh, the Senate? I'm, I'm not one that's very excited about uh, passing marijuana legislation, but I'm uh, pragmatic if, uh, you know, this is the direction of the caucus, uh, you know, then we'll, uh, you know, the bill will go through if, if that's what they see. But I'm not uh, optimistic that we're going to have everything in place to be able to get a bill passed this year, one of the concerns raised as the task force was doing its work is when you look at what the net revenue winds up being uh, when you take out all of the administrative costs 
that are involved, it may not be uh, the revenue generating mechanism that that it's being uh, advertised at. And I think that that's going to be part of that hard look at what the final report is going to say uh, that the speaker is referencing to. I want to ask you about both about public corruption. We saw, of course, some very high profile scandals hit the legislature last session um, and, you know, the public basically throwing up their hands at what had happened there. I'm interested to know from both of you what kind of guardrails you think should be put in place and, and if you think there will be legislation passed to try to increase uh, you know, safety, if you will, or uh, to, to root out some of the public corruption that we start uh, that we saw. Senate President, let's start with you. Uh, I'm confident that uh, some of the bills are going to be passed. Uh, you know, just how many, I don't know, but they'll be referred out. And, uh, you know, we know that uh, we'll be scheduling the hearings and, uh, you know, see, see where the, the testimony takes us, but I, I think uh, by the Capitol being reopened, uh, again, is a big uh, statement to have everybody available <clears throat> and uh, the ability to see see what we're doing and who's going in and out of whose offices, who's hanging out on the railing and things of that nature. The other thing that has uh, really been a positive of uh, the COVID experience is that uh, the legislature has put in a large investment in being able to now stream out all of the meetings live, to have a hybrid system in place where we're able to take testimony remotely. And it's not just to accommodate uh, the residents of the neighbor islands for those who live on the leeward coast or, uh, you know, live uh, in Kailua, Kaneohe, Waimanalo. It's not always that easy to get into town and get to the Capitol to testify. And I think we've really opened up the process and helped in transparency uh, by the way we're now able to stream the meetings. Mr. Speaker, are there specific recommendations that you think would be helpful? You know, we've heard talk of term limits. We've heard talk of fundraising uh, restrictions. What do you think uh, should be adopted from the recommendations? Yeah, so, you know, we know that the um, <clears throat> the cases that um, you know that that um, started a, a year ago, as well as the numerous county cases, affect public confidence in the legislative process. And you know we are very concerned about that um, because you know I, I will say that um, you know um, you know the actions of a few people affected everyone else at the legislature. And I will tell you that you know the members really are not engaged in this kind of behavior. Um, so one thing that we did last year was uh, form the uh, a commission to review stand uh, recommendations for standards of standards of conduct and this was the the task force that was chaired by judge dan foley and um uh, judge foley did issue a report to us a few weeks ago there are 31 recommendations in that report um not all of the recommendations require um introduction introduction of a bill but um, I'm, I know that there will be that the bills will be introduced uh, this session. We will ho hold public hearings on those on those proposals. Um, I think that there, that the the bills, you know, they, there's a range of there's a range of of initiatives in those proposals um, that we'll consider. And the other thing to remember is that we can also make changes um, through um, our house rules. We can change procedures um, administratively. Um, by amending our house rules. It doesn't have to be done through a, a statute. But we are going to be taking a hard look at the at the Foley Commission report. We are almost out of time, but I did want to just ask a few more questions, uh, specifically for you, uh, Senate President. One of the things that the Senate is responsible for doing, as we mentioned at the top, is to confirm the director positions for Governor Green's new cabinet. Uh, you, your uh, members of the Senate will go through that process of vetting and, and answering those questions and having those confirmation hearings uh, with the names that were submitted for the various departments. Uh, what are your thoughts about the way the cabinet leadership has shaped uh, and is shaping up? And, and are there any concerns or any pushback that you think some of these uh, departments may face with those that have been uh, appointed into these leadership positions? Uh, well, I had challenges getting to 
Oahu last Tuesday and had to cancel a bunch of meetings because I uh, couldn't get to the capital in time. But I've spent yesterday and I'm spending today meeting, uh, meeting with people. And I would say, um, you know, there, there are a few, 25%, a third that I don't even know who the individuals are. And so I'm taking an open-minded approach. Um, and, uh, you know, at this point, for most of the people I've talked to, I've just said, I'm not ready to commit my support yet. I'd like to see how you perform in uh, the position that you have and uh, we'll schedule a follow-up appointment. So if I've got questions or concerns, I could ask them, you could address them directly, uh, you know, or if you have now been in long enough to develop uh, clearer plans, then, uh, you know, I'd be interested to see that. And I'll just give you one example. I've known Ikaika Anderson for uh, a long time and uh, as a council member, but certainly have no idea what he would do in an administrative role. And he's working on how to spend the $600 million. So I said, let's schedule another appointment when you have a clear plan and then uh, the nominee for uh, the deputy's position is not somebody who I've worked with. I enjoyed my conversation with her that day and look forward to a uh, follow-up meeting uh, in, in the future. And then, uh, you know, I think next week when everybody gets back to the Capitol, we'll have a lot more opportunity for some feedback from people with who they've met and if there are concerns with some of the nominees and also uh, I'm fully expecting to hear from members how excited they are about certain nominees that they've talked to already. And Speaker, just for you and, and your relationship thus far with the Green Administration and, and your relationships, what are your thoughts entering this new relationship with a new governor and Lieutenant Governor, your former colleague, uh, Lieutenant Governor Luke, uh, your thoughts about moving forward and how you hope the, this relationship between the fifth floor and the legislature pans out over the next few years? You know, I, I personally like um, Governor Green. Um, I've served with him in, uh, in the House and um, when he began his legislative career here. And um, he's always been um, someone who is, um, who has been excited to be here, to be in, in government and in public service. And I, I know that he um, wants to work very closely with the legislature. He's going to be action oriented. I think he'll be decisive, although I, I did suggest to him that he not be too, you know, don't be too decisive. Sometimes you have to take a step back and think about your answer before you say <laughs> something. But, um, you know, I think he's going to be he's going to be very enthusiastic. I think he wants to do the right <laughs> thing. And um, he wants to work with the legislature to make a difference. Senator President, I would love to hear your thoughts on, on how you think that this relationship is going to be going forward, your expectations mm -hmm. of the new governor, uh, and also any interactions you may have had up until this point. I mean, I know that you're all very familiar with each other. There are no new faces there, but there are new responsibilities, and the relationships obviously change. Well, in fact, uh, right before I came down, I was meeting with the governor, uh, talking about, you know, some of the process with uh, nominations and also talking about, uh, you know, affordable housing and some of the plans that he has to try and address, uh, you know, our affordable housing situation. As I was leaving, the lieutenant governor was coming in for a meeting with, with the governor. So I'm encouraged to see that you know, what they've been saying publicly is really happening behind closed doors. I don't know if I'm not supposed to say that they were about to meet and uh, the lieutenant governor had her notepad with her. And, uh, you know, uh, to use all of the pieces is critical to move, uh, move forward. And uh, one thing I applaud the governor for is having the attorney general give a more liberal interpretation to the ability to get the money to the nonprofits, uh, almost 50 million was appropriated in grants and aids and uh, the nonprofits are addressing the most vulnerable in our community doing critical mission, a critical mission uh, for uh, the state and uh, they have not been able to get the money and with that decision 
uh, by the new AG and the governor, they're going to get that help and uh, the people in the community are going to get that money right away. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. There were a number of topics that we wanted to discuss, but just did not get around to having enough time to do so. Uh, so that just means we have to have you back on uh, again in the future. <laughs> So we can address some of the things that are happening, but always great to hear from both of you. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here uh, as we enter the new year and as we enter this next legislative session. Uh, we look forward to future conversations as well. H Happy New Year and thanks again for joining us. Same Happy to you, New thanks. Year, thanks. Aloha. Yanji, you are muted. There. Sorry about there. that. Always great to hear from them. And as you said, Ryan, we need to have them on again very soon because there are so many things that we didn't get to talk about. But one thing that was very clear is that while they do anticipate a positive working relationship with the fifth floor, uh, I don't expect them to be a rubber stamp on the Green administration's priorities. You heard some pushback there right off the start about the green fee that the, the then lieutenant governor and now governor campaigned on this idea of charging an access fee essentially to come to Hawaii. Hawaii. They're saying they don't see a legal mechanism to do that because you couldn't levy that at the airports. They are favoring what uh, Mr. Psyche called a Kochi fee, which would be sort of site specific things like Hanauma Bay or you see on Haleakala, a reservation system where you charge access to specific areas as opposed to just a statewide fee. Also, um, some reservations on the stadium as well and the new cabinet. You didn't hear uh, Speaker Kochi say that, or, or Senate President Kochi say that. Uh, they're all going to get confirmed. He's taking a very wait and see approach. Yeah, we also heard an update about their thoughts with the legalization of marijuana. Of course, uh, as we mentioned, this is an issue that continues uh, to make headlines throughout the country with other states adopting this policy. But the state of Hawaii right now, uh, currently with a task force that has been working in the off session to look at the mechanisms, the structure and all the tax implications that would have to go into creating a, essentially a new department within the Department of Health. And so uh, both of them saying that they're going to have to wait to see the report. But you heard there from the Senate president that he is not as optimistic, knowing that there is still a lot that needs to be done in order for something like that to happen. We also heard their thoughts about Governor Green's proposal to eliminate the tax on food and medicine. Uh, we heard from Speaker Psyche saying that uh, a different approach might be to just target uh, those individuals who it impacts the most rather than a blanket uh, sort of removal of this tax for everyone, which would include visitors as well. Uh, we also did get a, a really, you know, a picture to the working relationship between the governor and lieutenant governor, uh, Senate president, just coming from a meeting with the governor saying that he saw the lieutenant governor going in for a meeting and uh, should be interesting to see moving forward how these two bodies, the legislature and the fifth floor interact. Uh, we know at times, especially during the EG administration, there have been some pushback and some conflict. So we'll see how things pan out over the next four years. That's right. And one thing we can expect to see also coming out of the legislature are some new restrictions on guns. Of course, uh, in the interim, we saw that that concealed carry permits are being issued throughout the state of Hawaii. The county is taking that on, saying that certain areas should not be allowed to have people with guns on their persons in them. Um, but, you know, Joe Logan on this program, the HPD's chief, saying that it would be much better if there were a statewide system so that these restrictions were consistent county to county. We can expect to see something like that passed, or at least uh, proposed this session. Very interesting always to hear about the dynamics there that you mentioned, uh, and also the ethics recommendations that we are going to see. Uh, you know, there was a litany of suggestions made by those who reviewed what is going on at the legislature and the speaker saying, um, hey, there's there's maybe a way to do this without having to pass legislation that they could amend some of their rules so that they could impose uh, more ethics restrictions without actually having to take a full vote on them and get that passed. So we can expect a lot uh, coming out of this legislative session. Very interesting. One thing that we didn't get to talk about is Red Hill, and that is something that we are going to be addressing right here on Friday. Uh, we've invited the head of the Sierra Club here in Hawaii, along with uh, Mr. Hinken of Earth Justice, to talk about about what environmentalists are concerned with, uh, both on the fire suppressant spill and then the larger defueling uh, actions that are that are or are not being taken right now by the Navy. So we look forward to that conversation on Friday. We'll see you then. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.